Are you ready for your next great Civil War read? Then try the new historical novel, The Heavens Falling, by Jonathan Lucci. Follow the members of the Dawson family through the Civil War, from the halls of Congress to the bloody fields of battle, and from the decks of gunboats to the solitude of Lincoln's office. The Heavens Falling is available on Amazon in paperback and Kindle, or visit theheavensfalling.com to order. That's theheavensfalling.com. This episode of Addressing Gettysburg is brought to you in part by me, audiobook narrator Mike Scott, narrator of Savas Beattie's Bloody Autumn, the Shenandoah Valley Campaign of 1864, and, unlike anything that ever floated, The Monitor and Virginia and the Battle of Hampton Roads. If you are an author or publisher interested in having your titles produced as audiobooks, or even just in learning more about the process, give me a shout. You can find my contact info on my website, mikescottvoice.com. That's mikescottvoice.com. Com. Want the freshest cup of coffee in Gettysburg? Then visit Bantam Roasters, formerly 82 Cafe at 82 Steinware Avenue. They roast all of their coffee in-house, and they have a full coffee bar to keep you caffeinated during your trip. Visit them at www.raggededgerc.com for their menu and shipping options for all of their freshly roasted coffee. Use promo code HANCOCK for 10% off your order in the cafe. Hi, this is Darren. And Mayor from the Civil War Breakfast Club Podcast. And you are listening to Matt Callery at the Addressing Gettysburg Podcast. <laughs> From the Gettysburg Museum of History Studios, you're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to this episode of Addressing Gettysburg. And today we have one of our favorite friends here with us today. Uh, I said today twice. Uh, his name is Gary Edelman. You know him. You love him from the American Battlefield Trust, uh, licensed battlefield guide. Are you still have your license or did you give it up? No, I have not given it up. Good. I want to say I'm glad to be a favorite friend and continue to notice that you say my name Jersey style, Gary. Gary. Well, how is it supposed to go? Gary? Gary. 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 Well, that's according to me. You know, there's yeah. other Gary's out there. What is that? What accent is that? Chicago. That's Chicago. Yeah. Well, I should have known. Well, all right, Gary. Um, welcome <laughs> back to Justin Gettysburg. Your first time in our new studio. It's rocking, man. I, congrats. Thank you. Thank you very much. Today we're talking about Civil War photography. You love Civil War photography. Is this, was this like your first passion with the Civil War? This is my first passion with history. If it wasn't for Civil War photography, I would have, I never started reading for pleasure until photography, Civil War photography got me interested in history. Like it was, it was it. Frazanito's Frazanito. book. That was it. it was, how did you discover that? Uh, last day of my sophomore year of high school, like you don't know when your life's about to change. Mm -hmm. I just, I was friends with a slow test taker and I went to the library to wait for him. And I don't know why I gravitated toward this Auntie M book or whatever it said, because I didn't know, I didn't know what Antietam was nor right. how to say it. My right. mom told me it was Antietam. Um, <laughs> and I just picked it up and it was like a ready-made book for me. It, 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 it took Civil War photos, showed you the place now. And I did that as a kid. I would take pictures of buildings before they came down with the intention of going back later and taking that picture. I've, I was a then and now kid without even knowing there'd be such a thing. So that was oh, that's it. And the, the one I opened to was the Dunker Church at Antietam. And then the modern photo of it. Oh, my God, it's still there. It really hadn't occurred to me that you could go back that far. I didn't even know there were photos in the Civil War. Yeah, yeah. Maybe not even when the Civil War was right. until that day. And boom, I would have never been here, met my wife, you know, have the job I have. That was all because of that moment. Isn't that amazing? Just yeah. one thing like that, some one insignificant thing just yeah. totally changes. I was a D history student, by the way. I just uh, didn't read for pleasure. <laughs> really? Yeah. And now you've got a mind like a steel trap. Yeah, I, I, I may have had that before. I just Probably didn't did. read. You know what I got on my SAT verbal? What? Do you remember, you remember what a bad score is like in, on that respect? No, it was out of 800. Um, I got 360. Nice. My math doubled my verbal. And really? Because I never read. And then, you know. But you I, were good at math. I was good at math. I was never good at math. And I was good at writing. I just didn't know words. Interesting. So you didn't understand the science of language. <laughs> I guess I Is didn't understand what? anything, I guess. Like, <laughs> when you don't read, how do you know these things? That's true. So then, so you see this Antietam book and it's the then and now. And then uh, how quickly after that do you suddenly become like just ravenous for hip Civil War information. You know, it sort of didn't occur to me, I guess, that I could go to my local library and pick up more Civil War books. So I remember sort of pining, like, like pining to get back in the fall so I could check out books. And I picked up Mr. Lincoln's Cameraman uh, and by Roy Meredith and uh, 
James Horan, a, a book about Matthew Brady and Frazanito's Gettysburg book. And then I was really, okay. <laughs> you know, getting into it. So, and then I, you know, and I, I checked those books out. I eventually went to my local library and just started, you know, you know, absorbing Civil War information. And then I started getting those books for my birthday and Hanukkah and everything like that. And by the time I went to college, I had seven Civil War books wow. of my own. That was wow. a big deal. A whole seven. I, mean, yeah, you know, sure. I have a picture of them. I was all proud of it. <laughs> <laughs> so you, I think it's interesting that now you, um, I think most people would say they know you from doing videos with the the trust and, and they're not, shabby videos they're good videos Thank and i you. and i know you're not the techie guy behind it but I'm, sh I'm i'm i have to assume that you have some uh creative input into these things right yes i have a lot of that you know i i run a small education team and my team makes most of the videos for the trust 98 percent of them or something like that so yes i have an outsized influence on what we shoot uh you know but chris white and i run the department together and we try to shoot things at that intersection of what we want to do and what our members will find interesting. And that advances the mission of the trust, you know, save more land, inspire and educate the public about what happened at these places, you know. So we have an endless list that we'll never finish. And yes, I mean, it's much to their, their I have a very patient team because I have ideas all the time in the shower while I'm walking and everything yeah, like that. Yeah. And, hey, we should do this. And, and for their, <laughs> from their perspective, I come up to them with great frequency saying, I don't know what this is yet, but it's going to be great. <laughs> and they're, they're pretty, they're pretty patient about it. And they've learned how to push back on me. So you're very, that. you're very lucky. I wish I had a team of technical people who could support my crazy ideas. I got to do all that. This took years <clears throat> for what it's worth, you know, while, while I grew sort of the department and the department doesn't grow unless you're getting views, right. unless you're making money. Right. And, you know, and having members support it. So it, it took years. I mean, I didn't even have a full-time video guy. The trust never did <clears throat> until about, I think, 2019, okay. maybe 18, something like that. Yeah. But they're entertaining. We love them. And uh, I want to publicly thank you for uh, including me in the 30th anniversary of the movie Gettysburg videos. That was a real treat for me because I, I love that video. And I loved getting to go around and seeing all the locations where they shot. Cool. Uh, yeah. The different scenes yeah. with the actors. It was great having you involved, and you're you're yet to show up as much as you might in some of the later videos. Oh, that thank might God! Out. So you were also key in helping to connect me with a lot of the key people. Yeah, so yeah. Thank you, John. John too. John. John Pinkerton. But uh, John. John is he? Oh, uh, you know, this whole Gettysburg 30th anniversary really couldn't have happened without him. I mean, he has the connections more than the actors. And it, <laughs> everybody yeah. else. It, it's true. It's uh, I always tease him about being a stalker, and uh, you know, this would be the one time where being a stalker pays off. Well, he's just such a nice stalker. He he, he treats people so well that they want to interact with him and help him. So way to go, Jeff. He's a respectful stalker. That's exactly right. Indeed. Um, all right. So let's talk about this here. We have limited time with Garrick today, folks. So uh, we're talking about Civil War photography. Now, I've got a slideshow here that I can get to. And folks uh, watching at home, you're really it's going to be a real mess because, again, I'm doing this. Because you don't have myself. a full-time tech guy. I don't guy have a full-time tech guy team. like Gary does. <laughs> so that's why we need more members over at Patreon. <laughs> um, okay. So. Go ahead. Get get us into first of all, let's start with the basics of civil war photography. We all have cameras in our phones now. And it's easy. Oh, look at that. I want to take a picture. You pull it out, you snap it, you take a picture. Oh no, that's not good. Let me do it again. Yeah. Right? Didn't have that luxury back then. You would have to have developed it right away, very quickly, right? Yeah. So, I mean, how I, does to, it all work? To put it this way, first of all, I mean, on a busy battlefield day where I'm not giving a tour, where I'm just taking pictures and doing things. I mean, I could take more pictures in one day on my smartphone than all of the photographers who ever recorded photos of Gettysburg in the whole year of 1863. Wow. So you could do yeah. this in one day. Yeah. A good output would be 10 or 15 photos. You know, you could arguably shoot a little bit more, but you're talking about you need the good weather conditions and, and, and you, you know, you, they take 10, 15 minutes if you're great at it. Right. And that doesn't say anything about finding the right location, setting up your tripod. So I, I did want to talk about, if I may, uh, how these photos are made real yeah, quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you've seen them, the big bulky cameras, and maybe you've seen the big darkroom wagons in which they traveled. What is it wagon? What's it wagon? Mobile developing boxes, sort of. And, uh, you know, this is the difference. There are thousands of photographers in America, but only a handful, and I mean a couple of dozen, that actually left their studios, the profitability of a studio yeah. where you can do things much more easily. You know this. Yeah, they can come to you. Business. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and speculatively go out into the field and shoot photos you don't know if anybody's going to find interesting or buy. Right. And you're doing that with complex chemicals and glass plates and everything like that. So not too many people did it. And when they did, they had to have this bulky camera and these glass plates and prepare all their chemicals and place the camera where they wanted it. Ideally in a place where 
there's more than one interesting thing to see because you mm. don't want to unhitch your horses and pour your chemicals and do all that for just one or two photos. Right. So they do that and then they set up their camera where they want it. Then they prepare a plate. These are teams of two or three. You can't do this very well alone. Mm -hmm. um, and they're going to prepare the plate. They're going to coat it in a sticky substance called collodion that'll hold the light sensitive material, silver, silver nitrate, on there, sort of like a Band-Aid. In fact, collodion would sort of become liquid bandages later. And then you're going to put it in a light proof box, run it out to the camera, put it into the camera, take the lens cap off so as to expose it to light after two, three, four, five, ten seconds, put it back on. This is a photographer's guess on how long to expose it. That's the shutter. Then you run it back to there. And yes, like you said, you have to develop it right there. It's a wet plate process most of the time. So you only have minutes before it dries out and it never gets developed. They develop it right there. They sort of fix or cure it. And then you could, you know, make one, two, three, four, a thousand copies from that plate. It's a negative that if you put a black background behind it becomes a positive, which is an ambrotype. So you have all these daguerreotype, ferrotype, right. tin type types of things, but they all come from similar processes. So you mentioned the chemicals, um, you know, you, so you kind of. You don't have to be a chemist, but you have to understand at least the chemistry of what you're doing. It, yeah, and yeah. you're dealing with like really dangerous substances too, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, you, and, and it's not surprised when you, you you meet wet plate photographers today, most of them, not all of them, <laughs> most of them are a little bit, there's something a little up. Now, is this because they're artsy or because of the chemicals? I mean, Could I don't both. know. I mean, there's ether yeah. thrown in there and iodides and bromides and, you know. Cyanide? Uh, is that, yeah, yeah, or so, arsenic? So, yeah, yeah, you can use arsenic in it. So there's not just one way to get to the town square, but there are. <laughs> The, you know, it's a dangerous business. And then you're underneath a hood with all these chemicals. You're breathing them yeah. in and whatnot without a N95 mask or anything like yeah, that. Right, so, right. You know, but, you so, know, you, you hear about uh, the Mad Hatter, and that would be, uh, from what I understand, that, that comes from, you know, the chemicals they would use in hat making would make them crazy. From yeah. So I'm surprised we don't hear about the Mad Photographer. But yeah. I would imagine maybe they didn't last very long in the business, like they weren't lifelong photographers. Yeah, I, oddly, I mean, you know, they say that Matthew Brady stopped photographing, photographing later, and uh, he probably wasn't in the darkroom a whole lot. That's for like mm -hmm. a lower level person. And he did live a pretty long life compared to Alexander Gardner and some of these other guys. So it would be interesting to do a study of that. I've never seen anybody try to equate, right. you know, the, the, the danger of the business, nor have I known of more than one photographer who died while applying his trade, although there probably are others. Another guy like drank somebody's photochemicals thinking it was lemonade and they had to like pump his stomach to the degree that they could. But the most famous photographer, I probably have, a, I don't I don't think I have a photo in here of it, but, um, you know, Roper's Rock at Chattanooga on Lookout Mountain. Mm. He was a soldier indeed. But what people don't know is he became a photographer later and it was while photographing people that he fell off of Roper's Rock. Oh, really? Um, so he's the photographer that I know of to be put, <laughs> to put himself in the most danger of the Civil War. Wow. Mr. Roper's Rock. Yeah. Uh, let me, I'm going to go to uh, the, so here, it's looking funny there. But here's here's an example, right? What are we looking at yeah, here? Yeah, so this is a What's It Wagon or a What Is It Wagon. That's a Brady one off the top of my head at Cold Harbor. So you could see they, they live next to the wagon. The box on the back there is, you know, the, the dark room, so to speak. And you could see where they would sit between the tent and the uh, dark room thing. And uh, we talked earlier about zooming in. I'm not sure if I have it high res enough here, but the guy on the right is actually holding a turkey leg. Um, if you were to really zoom in on it, I, I, I you know, I'm bringing this up just to mess with you because yeah, you said this would be a train wreck <laughs> if we try it. Well, look, he's pulling up the proper zoom. Let's People get see. to even see your methodology you see here, Matt. Oh, that's oh, he didn't enough, zoom in though. very much. That's though. 100 percent. All right, let me see. Okay, right, keep going. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, so so they had to live in these things. Remember, they had to get to the battlefield in these things, and you could only bring a fixed number of plates with you. Now, could you imagine, like, breaking your plates on the way back, you know, oh. after I'm reminded of our friend JD, who actually yes. lost his equipment after shooting. It's yeah. one thing to lose it before, but imagine these precious glass plates being lost. You see the turkey leg? Yeah, there? look at that. <laughs> you know, unless it's an extraordinarily <laughs> large chicken. So, I mean, these guys lived there. And I believe that's uh, David Knox uh, on the left right there. So these are Brady assistants. And we can, you know, sort of, you know, follow them through the Civil War. And sometimes, you know, when they worked for other people, they would get credit for their views. And I still, I've been talking about this for years. I think you could probably look at the fingerprints inherent on the edges. See how you're going toward the edge yeah, over there? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes a fingerprint shows up and maybe we could start to identify oh, whose fingerprints That would be whose, cool. And we could figure out who took some of the, you know, photos. There's different it's types of It's funny you say that because yeah. I've, I've seen those before on old photos and I've often wondered, I'm like, I wonder if someone is intrepid enough to try to figure out 
out. I don't know how yeah. the hell you would do. You'd have to get something we know they touched. Yeah, yeah, and you know? a glass plate in this case. No, you know, I mean you know. like another thing that we yes, know they touched. Yes, you're right. Or you could say, well, you know, in this case, we know Brady only had two assistants, and you know, this guy is, you know, is you know credited with doing X with actually exposing it, so we know it's not him. Blah blah blah. Right. So th- it would have to be a real deal thing, but like you said, you know, intrepid. Uh, is the idea. I am just talking about it. I am right. not uh, you know, actually, actually, doing it. <laughs> actually doing it. I'm trying to get other people to do it. Yeah, that's a lot of work. All right. So, um, okay. Can, so continue then. So what else do they do then? So, you know, they would go out in the field. I mean, and what's interesting is that, if I may, you know, Matthew Brady, who came and photographed Gettysburg, he was, by my count, the third one to get here after who the battle. Who was the first? Uh, definitely Alexander Gardner and his crew. And it's no surprise he's the only one to get dead soldiers on the battlefield before they were buried. Nobody else did that. Right. Um, and Gutekunst was second. So whenever you yeah. see um, a, uh, 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 a dead soldier photograph, that's Alexander Gardner. If they're actually dead. Because then you've got the Weavers having people pose yes. and you've got Brady having people pose or at least lay down. So it really depends. But that's what William Fresnito did. He didn't just locate where the pictures were taken. He figured out when, where, and by whom the mm-hmm. photo was being taken. And that changed everything because that affects the date, that affects what it should look like and everything like that. So um, that's what Fresnito did was by figuring out when, where, and by whom, by separating them into series, suddenly you have a historical document more rich in information than you did before. Yeah. Uh, and that's what he really did. But in any case, what Brady got here, uh, what I wanted to explain is that he's he goes through like Robert E. Lee's going through now and Grant is going through now. You know, your your reputation and what people say about you changes over the years. Mm. By the way, that's the nature of history, everybody. This is not revisionist history. Right. It's, you know, this is what happens. You know, people yeah. interpret it and they do that in the time in which they live. Um, mm-hmm. So Brady was often credited with taking every photo of the Civil War. And then people started saying, wait, he had failing eyesight. He didn't take any pictures of the Civil War. And now we've come where somewhere in the middle, I think. But the key about Brady is, is that just about every famous Civil War photographer, Gardner, Barnard, Russell, uh, you know, O'Sullivan, Gibson, Ward, Knox, uh, they all either worked for or were trained by Matthew Brady. Like, so he okay. is the man. So, yeah. So he's like the father of uh, the father. That's a better way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. He, he was he was award winning. You know, uh, you know, he, his work was unparalleled and he better than all the other guys understood how to brand himself, how to make himself an upscale brand. But, you know, not how to run a business. Exactly. The technology of photography was not new in 1861. No. It had been around for a while. So these guys didn't just. Well, I'm going to I'm, I'm assume I'm just going to throw this out and you correct it. These guys didn't just pick up the hobby when the war began to go shoot the war. No, probably some did. But yes, most of them were already itinerant photographers or, you know, moving around the country or they had a studio in a town. But there's a good chance they learned from Brady or one of his disciples if he was an American photographer. There are certainly others that taught themselves the mm. craft and learned from somebody else over in France or something like right. that. Um, but uh, kind of like Bob Ross. Yeah, yeah, you like, could say that. Yeah, you know, <laughs> you know, somebody's gonna maybe hopefully make a meme now with both <laughs> of us, Brady with, 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 the yeah, afro. Brady with the afro or something like that. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, and and sometimes when you look at the work of these photographers, you can tell who the artist is. Mm-hmm. You know, you look at some of O'Sullivan stuff later in the war, and him and Gardner out west after the Civil War, and some of Matthew Brady stuff. It's just artistry, and others are more documentarians. Others are three D focused, and other guys are really into flat photography. Let me say that probably 80% of the outdoor photos, and we think that there are about 10,000 outdoor documentary photos, not portraits, but the ones taken of battlefields, camps, and prisons, and hospitals, and things like that. We think there's about 10,000 of those, and that as many as 80% are taken in 3D with a twin lens camera to make a stereo plate that they Mm. can then make into one of those cards that you put into one of those viewers so that they're in 3D. So when when people like me and Bob Zeller and Center for Civil War Photography do 3D stuff, it's no contrivance. The photographers thought— that's how people are going to see them. Yeah. And they shot them with that in mind. Yeah, I have one of those uh, viewers. But I, all, the, all the cards I have are World War One. That's still cool. They're, they're awesome, allowed. though. I yeah. mean, they're fascinating. Um, but the, uh, 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 okay, so <laughs> Gettysburg, Gardner comes first. Mm-hmm. He gets the dead bodies. Yes. The actual dead bodies. Yeah. 
Um, I had I had uh, Dr. James Beagley on the other day. I don't know if you know who he I is. Know him. Oh, you know I know him. I know him as Jim. Jim, okay. Well, <laughs> I, you know, he goes by Dr. James on uh, YouTube, so I thought He's been I was... doing digital stuff for a while. He has. While. He has. And we did one on colorizing old photos. Yes. And he came in and he showed, you know, the process. We we stripped away the layers and then added them back on to show how we colorized them. And we were we were focusing on the the uh, shot of the soldier whose abdomen is I think most people believe now that it was eaten by pigs yes. or hogs. Yeah. Uh, but originally it was credited as a uh, artillery yes. uh, wound. Um, and uh, now where do you fall on that one? Are you hogs or? Yeah, it looks like he's been disemboweled. Yeah. You know, it definitely looks like it's that. Too, it's too neat to be an artillery wound. It, uh, not that I've seen any, but I would imagine. Yeah, I don't know if I'd call it neat, but uh, but I mean, the way it looks like an animal has been rooting up into his yeah, ribs. Right. Eating um, all the good stuff. Yeah. And yeah. some have called him Mr. Eaton before, actually, oh. that, that soldier, which is probably not OK. <laughs> nasty pun. Um, you know, and it's also, you know, really, uh, though, Frazanito is at his best sometimes, not when he's locating something, but when he says somewhere in Georgia, you know, or South Carolina, um, you know, a, a family is anxiously awaiting you know, word about their son. And it's easy to look at these people as not people, you know, as as nameless corpses. And he calls war the most disgusting of all obscenities, having been in it himself. It is uh, disgusting. And there's another picture I saw in your collection here. And I want to. Oh, which one is it? I'll help you. I think it's this one. Nope, it's not that one. I think it's this one. This one. Yeah. This one, uh, Dr. James and I were looking at, too, and there's another guy who looks pretty nasty. Have you seen him? You yeah, know? no, he's Just, also been disemboweled, uh, yeah. you know, and that, but he, he looks more torn apart. I wonder that. You see, by the way, the grave up above him to the upper left. You can see a, a fresh grave well, um, in there. And, and by the way, this remains because a lot of people focus on the harvest of death and unfit for service. But yeah, look at that. This I mean, you know, here. he really got, but it looks, it looks like hogs. Uh, I mean, we have accounts of it happening. Of course, we also have accounts of people being torn apart by artillery. Yeah, but sure. If you go a little left, yeah, there's a grave right oh, yeah. there. Oh, yeah. Can at you that. go any further left? Yep, yep, that yep. Yeah, there you go. Look at that. You can see a fresh, fresh a headboard. Uh, you know, not unlike those that we saw elsewhere on the Rose wow. Farm, but, you know, that's one of our photo mysteries. Now, this isn't easy. The only way to find this thing is to find that big tree that they're laying around in another picture that really shows it. Other than that, or some of the stuff in the background, it's going to be tough. So some of the remaining mysteries are remaining mysteries for a reason. So we don't know where very, this is? No, we don't. Uh, you know, and, and Gardner himself was so inconsistent with his, you know, labeling and captioning of things. And he was too, he was too early there to get a competent guide. Remember, he gets there two days after the battle ended. Right. You know, so nobody knows what's what. Where's the left of the line? Where's the right? So when he says left, right, and center, it's practically meaningless, but right. you can start to couch together what he means based on the locations that have been found. Well, and not to bring up an old argument of ours, but uh, when you talk about the harvest of death photos, he's, yeah. what does he label it as? Like, Near where General Reynolds was killed well, he, or something? He took five photos and only one of them is associated with Reynolds. Okay. The others, some of the others are associated with the language he used on the South End, you know, and, and that's See? when you get into the horrors of death, that's where you have people more picking uh, <laughs> what they want to use, the information they want to use instead of the totality more than with any other Civil War mystery that I know of. Yeah. We're not going to get into that today because Gary has limited time. Oh man, I even brought some notes. Oh, do you yeah, have, what do you I have? exactly want to. <laughs> well, I know you never want to, uh, but I want to with you one day. Oh, we, yeah. I mean, we could. Do I want to hear you because last time we talked about it on the show, you said Scott Hartwig is wrong. And I said, OK, how's he wrong? And you go, I don't need to tell you how he's wrong. He's just wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and well, I was like, that's not an answer. Well, yeah, but, well, because we didn't have time. Uh, we didn't have time. Day. And I want to I want I would love to do one one day where we parse that. Yeah. But what I would like to say, if we're not going to cover it today, is this well, idea we can that if you well, is this idea that that uh, people want to advance a theory without looking to why they might be wrong themselves. When somebody advances these theories, they are all in for their theory. They know it's right. Yeah. And nobody can tell them otherwise. And trust me, I know this. People don't like, you know, talking to me sure. about this stuff. Still don't know how I've ended up in this position. Uh, <laughs> you know, so, so they, they don't, they don't go to, you know, say why their theory is wrong. They only focus on why it's right. And then it's up to me to focus on why theirs is wrong. You know, it, no, I, I think I was asking you because I believe the evidence that he laid out yeah. made sense to me. I want to hear the opposite side because because uh, and, you know, you, you you mentioned people have a theory and they find things that fit yeah. it. Right. Yeah. Yes. But well, right. And we exactly. And we just went through this a couple of weeks ago. Jen Murray and I, we did a JFK show and the comments are nothing but yes, buts. Mm -hmm. And um, and I'm like you. I come and I go. 
but that's not proof of conspiracy. That's my only answer yeah. to a lot of yeah. So, so, but, but I want, but the, the whole thing, I used to be a conspiracy theorist there until I said, you know what? I want to be fair. So let's, what's the other side of the story? And then yeah. I was like, oh, I was wrong. Like, I, I'm pretty sure Oswald did it. So that's why I want to yeah, know. Yeah. I mean, you know, so first of all, the photo research is different than everything else. Sure. Uh, all it takes is one piece of contrary evidence to blow it away. Like, right. you know, if you have a photo from another direction saying there's a huge boulder or a tree there and suddenly it doesn't appear two minutes later, there's a big problem there, right? Mm -hmm. You know, with, with the Hartwig, and I'll jump it in with John Stewart, who advanced that many years before Scott and John Cummings, who isn't in the exact same spot and all the other ones that put it on that ridge there. You know, they they do not account for the trees in a Gutekunst view taken four days later looking up the Chambersburg Pike. Uh, See, this is what I would like to well, know. I mean, all of this is on the old Gettysburg Daily videos where yeah, I I'm not going to watch these yeah, videos. Yeah, I don't know if you can even watch them. I think they're on Flash, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, so, so they don't account for that. They don't really talk about why the ridge looks differently. Now, John Cummings has tried and tried, you know, and he's addressed many of my concerns, not adequately in my opinion, but this is what we're supposed to do, by the way. I think sure. we're supposed to yeah. argue about this stuff, you know, and try to figure it out. But let me give an example uh, on that. So I don't think the terrain matches. I don't think think it matches with, you know, all the known maps. I certainly don't think the dip in the background of the one that shows the horse right. is consistent with the dip that we can see in post-war photos of the 143rd Pennsylvania Monument, Ben Crippen, that you can see a dip in the background and it's not in the right place. And that that's pretty clear to me. So, so yeah, so a friend and I took uh, like the, the high quality scan from the Library of Congress uh, mm -hmm. out on an iPad once. And we went out there with Scott's article trying to, you know, match everything up. Right. And it was it's that south view, you know, um, when and this is where I, w I was trying to find holes in it. So and the one thing I, I caught myself was, well, I was like, well, wait a minute. There's a road on this ridge now. Yep. I don't know how that changed the topography of the ridge. Did it raise it? Did it lower it? Did it change the way it looks, the curve of it? I don't know. I don't know what it looked like before yeah. that. And so like to me, that's... But it's not going to change the tree line in the background. You Correct. Know, you could say the tree line has changed, changed between 1863 and 1890. Okay. You know, I can buy all that. But let, let me like, you know, so there's a lot of other things. There's yeah. also a tree in front of Lee's headquarters uh, where Lee's headquarters would be if those theories are right. Okay. Or at least John Cummings' version. You know, Hartwig really doesn't. He kind of edges this stuff out. So people play with the, the angle the, the, of the photos, yeah. too, which, by the way, are fixed. Right. The most recent set, uh, 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 Mr. Brannon's thing in a Civil War Monitor. I mean, it's just he doesn't pay any attention to the fact that the angles are fixed. And, and most people don't do this. They, they set up a panorama where two photos are right next to each other, not in practically opposite directions. Mm, that's very that's important. A good point, yeah. And they, you can't play with those. They're, right. they're fixed. Right. In any case, uh, you know, there's a tree that shows up in the heart, the, the one that shows, you know, more bodies in the grave digger. And uh, there's a tree that, you know, should, you know, be on the other side of the Chambersburg Pike. And it clearly isn't. And when you move from one side to the other, that tree looks like it's you know, kind of all over the roof of that building because we can see those trees in the Gutekunst view looking up the Chambersburg Pike. I wish I could somehow say this easily, but I needed like a 30-part video series right. in order to get this across. But I want to say one more thing. Yeah. The, the, the thing about my, call it bitterness, about how I've become, okay, prove me wrong then. Like, you know, uh, first of all, you've heard me say this before, like, Tim Smith doesn't have cancer, at least as far as I know. You know, <laughs> tell me how, you know, uh, drinking Budweiser didn't make that happen. Well, there's a lot of evidence against that. You know, I can't prove a negative sure. or something like that. But in this game, people who place those photos there uh, are completely willing to disregard that every photo we know of the dead that has been identified precisely is miles from there. We don't have a single Gardner photo anywhere in, uh, beyond or north of town, northwest of town. Not one. And then two, those people also say, well, the photographers are so busy on the Emmitsburg Road. I mean, they must have approached on some other road and used the Fairfield Road. So they're able to talk about, oh, God, it was really busy on that road. Well, what about the Fairfield Road? It's like the main union route of advance toward the Confederates going on there. So they're willing to say that the Emmitsburg Road is busy. That must have pushed them over to the Fairfield Road without considering what the Fairfield Road was like. So people pick and choose to try to support their theory. And yeah. I, 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 one day I hope somebody supports, you know, advances something and that it's completely right. And we can finally stand there. People <laughs> accuse me of all sorts of things like, you know, oh, I'm mad because it's not my theory. I mean, when was the last time I advanced the harvest <laughs> of death theory? Like, I just think people should be more careful about it, yeah. you know, and say, here's a possible instead of this is it damn it call civil war times
I don't, but I don't know if, uh, and, and I don't want to belabor this point, I don't know if Scott was saying this is it, but he was saying, <laughs> I think it's here because of yeah. this. But I don't think he was saying, you know. Scott was a little bit more measured, but then yeah. Civil War Times said it was, it, even though they put a question mark on it sometimes and not others, you right. know. So, um, you know, there, there's people who say, like, you know, I, I'm pretty sure this is it. And then it becomes even worse, a popularity contest. You've engaged in some of this before. Like, well, I like this one more than that one. No. <laughs> Every spot is either completely right or completely wrong. Right, there's no right. 70% right here. <laughs> it's a, so that drives me crazy, too. But you don't have... Uh, you don't have uh, a theory as to where it is. Do, no. you, if Jim Smith doesn't have cancer, I don't know how to cure cancer either. So I don't. I can say he doesn't have cancer without having the cure for cancer. <laughs> sure. <laughs> no. 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 I, I'm yeah, not. So, I'm not saying. I'm not saying it's a, to to be that way. Yeah. I'm just saying. Uh, I'm asking you, do you have an idea where you think it might be? You know, I mean, I think it's on the south end, but right, but it, not specifically. If, if, if some, if, if 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 it meets the two things it need to needs to. Terrain match and matches all known 1860 known 1863 features. It could be in Hanover. It could yeah. be in Antietam. I'm willing to accept any possibility, but the most likely place is on the south end of the field because that's where all the other dead were photographed. It's also kind of rockless, like the first day's right. field and stuff like that. So, I mean, you know, wouldn't uh, it be funny though if it was a completely different battle that just got mixed up in that collection? Frazanito, you know, says this, but it did appear in Harper's Weekly not long after the Battle of Gettysburg. Ah. It is associated as Gettysburg. Okay, how many? There's only eight times in the war that photographers actually photographed dead on the field, and they're all northern photographers, uh, as far as we know. And it's very hard to have a Union victory coinciding with photographers. Getting getting there quickly enough and getting access before the dead are buried. Great. Take a break. We'll be right back. Hey, if you're in need of a sign and are in the Chambersburg area, you need not look any further than Bear Sign Service. They offer lighted and non-lighted signs, vehicle lettering and wraps, flags and flagpoles, and can ship anywhere. With over 75 years of being in business, Bear Sign Service is the oldest full-service sign company in Franklin County. So check them out at bearsign.com. That's B-A-E-R-S-I-G-N.com. And tell them you heard about them on Addressing Gettysburg. Who can forget the sounds of the 60s? The 1860s. I can't and you can't either. Now there's Marching Through Georgia, the exciting new album by Billy Webster. All of your favorite hits of the 1860s in one place. Such hits as Gary Owens. The Battle Hymn of the Republic. All quiet along the Potomac tonight. Marching through Georgia. And much, much more. So what are you waiting for? Go to billysongs.com and order your digital download of Billy Webster's Marching Through Georgia today. That's billysongs.com. If you're a lover of history, then go to trhistorical.com. There, you'll find apparel, drinkwear, decor, and more featuring a wide range of subjects from the ancient world to the Cold War. Looking to make an impression with the perfect gift? Well, TR Historical now offers a vintage wrapping service for a truly unique presentation. And our listeners will save 15% when using promo code GBERG1863 at checkout. So go to trhistorical.com. TR Historical, for the love of history. Movies and documentaries about history are spread out across the internet, and their quality is often suspect. History Fix delivers curated historic programming to your preferred device using their website or branded apps. Join History Fix for movies, documentaries, short films, and how-tos. Content covers historic eras ranging from the 1st to the 21st centuries. Their team of curators brings you the most comprehensive and authentic historical content available. Addressing Gettysburg podcast fans receive 20% off their first annual subscription. So what are you waiting for? Sign up at www.historyfix.com and use promo code ADGBURG. That's A-D-G-B-U-R-G. Every subscription begins with a seven-day risk-free trial. And after signing up, download the History Fix app on your smartphone. So go to www.historyfix.com and use promo code ADGBURG. That's A-D-G-B-U-R-G on an annual subscription. Escape into history with History Fix. 
For the Historian has a wide variety of titles, new and used, of military books from publishers like Osprey, Gettysburg Publishing, Stackpole, Savas Beatty, UNC Press, and more. I make it a point to go there once a week because I have new bookshelves to fill and I never know what treasures I'll find, and neither will you. They even have toy soldiers, model kits, games, children's books, and more. So stop by and check them out on your next visit to Gettysburg, or better yet, order right now online at ForTheHistorian.com and mention that you heard about them on Addressing Gettysburg in the Note to Seller box, and they will refund you your shipping. And if you call 717-685-5207 or stop by the store on your next visit and mention us, you'll get 20% off retail price. That's ForTheHistorian.com or 717-685-5207. Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center, Gettysburg's premier museum, is housed in the historic Lutheran Seminary Building constructed in 1832, a witness to the first day of battle. The museum's three floors of exhibits connect visitors to the dilemmas that led to the Civil War, provide a powerful and personal view of the battle's first day, and explore one of the battlefield's largest hospitals. No visit to Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center is complete without a guided tour of the building's famous cupola, where on the eve of battle, officers and civilians saw thousands of Confederate soldiers' campfires burning to the west, and Brigadier General John Buford watched for vital federal reinforcements as fighting erupted on the morning of July 1st. Today, you can stand where Buford stood and discover how this view helped chart the course of the Battle of Gettysburg. Your trip to Gettysburg is not complete without a serious visit to Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center, Gettysburg's premier museum. Purchase tickets online at seminaryridgemuseum.org or call 717-339-1300. To get tickets or a cupola tour, listeners may call or walk in and mention address in Gettysburg or by ordering online using the promo code AG1863 for 20% off. Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center. It began here. There's a devil to pay. Hey, Gettysburg business owners. Winter is just around the bend, and you know what that means. No tourists. But just because people aren't coming to you doesn't mean you can't bring your business to them. If you ship, you're still in the game. And if you're a seasonal business, the time to advertise for your next season is in the off-season when people are making their plans. So what's an affordable yet highly effective way of reaching those people? Well, it's not radio. It's not TV, and it's certainly not print. Step out of the Jurassic era of advertising and run an ad on Addressing Gettysburg. We just reached one million downloads, and we're growing by the tens of thousands every month. Beyond that, our audience is happy to support those who support their favorite podcast. So email sales at Addressing Gettysburg for more information about advertising on our show. We look forward to helping your business grow. That's sales at addressinggettysburg.com. Civil War Trails is the world's largest open-air museum offering over 1,500 sites and stories for you to explore. Each Civil War Trails site has an interpretive sign to help fuel your imagination as you stand on remote mountaintop artillery positions, in fields where thundering cavalry charges took place, or in now quiet downtowns where raids, riots, or raiders shattered the peace. Over 60 Civil War Trail sites allow you to stand in the footsteps of the Gettysburg Campaign across Virginia, West Virginia, Maryland, and of course, Pennsylvania. In fact, they are expanding further into Pennsylvania now with the latest sites in Wrightsville, Hanover, and Chambersburg. As you travel the trail, you'll find more than just great history. Beyond battlefields, great barbecue, beer, and bourbon await. Here's a pro tip, carry cash, and never book your day completely to ensure that you can take that gravel road, explore that hiking trail, or pick up an amazing artifact from that awesome antique shop you find along the way. Request a free brochure shipped right to your door at civilwartrails.org, and be sure to snap a hashtag sign selfie next time you are out exploring. Click the link to Civil War Trails in our show notes. Follow Civil War Trails and create some history of your own. You're listening to the Addressing Gettysburg podcast with Matt yeah, okay. Callery. All right, enough on the harvest of death. We'll get into that Ooh. another time. So go ahead. Continue. So I, with... I was on Gardner just real quick. I'll note that, you know, he took 72 photos in 1863 at Gettysburg. Remember, he came back for the Gettysburg Address where he recorded another, oh, uh, right, yeah. you know, another series as well. So he by far took the most here. Brady only got 35 or so. Gutekunst, who came between Gardner and Brady, Philadelphia, got 10. Charles Himes, he was a dry plater. Uh, he, he used dry plate. He could take longer to develop his. Mm. Coming out, of, I think Carlisle took two. Um, and then the Tysons and the Weavers took a bunch more. Tyson, at least 22 in 1863. The Weavers, maybe 16 or 18. And then the Tysons and Weavers, local, 
Gettysburg, Hanover, are going to come back in the years later and record more extensive series to, you know, sort of blow those out of the waters, the early post-war stuff. And that's very helpful in helping to identify sure. mysteries. And there's a bunch of other guys, Corley's and Backrack and others that either come for the Gettysburg Address or just a few other things. So we've got this chronological order that Frasnito set up on who arrived when, and he refined it as his books went out. By the way, if you're listening and this interests you about Gettysburg photography, don't just read Gettysburg A Journey in Time. You should read that. But early photography at Gettysburg mm. updates 20 more years of information after Journey, and it's also three times more content. It's a masterpiece of a book. And even it's outdated in certain ways now, too. Sure. And you have a lot of videos with the Trust uh, photography role. I love the ones where you, like, walk into the old picture. Yeah, we sort of called those step into history. Yes, the first step, into step didn't go well, so now we're calling them then and now, because that's a term people are more familiar with. But yeah, now we've got the Gettysburg address scene, we've got Fredericksburg. That's and, so cool. You know, they're they're very expensive to make with our production partner, partner yeah. Wide Awake Films, but uh, they're they're great, and they probably get us the best comments we ever receive, because well, it's you're just, actually yeah, it's, you know, it's moving fascinating. Uh, I, see, I look at it from a technical point of view, I'm just like, how the hell do they do that? Yeah. You know, yeah, leave that to the tech wizards. This was yeah. their idea, you know, about seven years ago. And I kept coming back to it until the tech has allowed this to happen. I mean, we've shot 12 more, right. uh, but having the money to produce them is, you know, is, is a different matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you'll get there someday, someday, Gar. Yeah. So, all right. So they, they come and they take the, the pictures now. Um, some of them we know, or we're very sure that they posed not living men, but dragging a dead body and posing him in different places, like the talking yes. about the sharpshooter yeah. shot. Yeah, yeah. So what posing is is interesting. You know, th there's, there's actually, you know, moving an arm and a leg. There's also composing the scene by moving a shell or bringing a prop rifle or right. something like that. And then there's also the one, and I say one instance known where they actually relocated a body, and that is the dead sharpshooter, the most photographed corpse of the Civil War. Mm. And of course, we don't know his name. Again, that's another area like the Harvest of Death that people just want to say, I know who that is. Let's <laughs> make, call the magazines and everything right, like right. that with with only circumstantial evidence, you know, sometimes at best. And this is why I like identifying rocks. <laughs> like, you know, people are tough. <laughs> like, they're much harder, especially when you don't have a girl, good early photo of them right. um, to really compare it to from the same year. Also, or something a like that. living person and a dead person look very different. Yes, they do. Um, but yeah, exactly. You're right. You know? I mean, but but I, this isn't going to sound profound. I'm aware of how this sounds. But one thing I've learned is, you know, being a social media person, I'll post a group of people and there's somebody out in the crowd who's, oh, there's a woman, there's a black person. Like they could be all white soldiers and they're going to see black people. They're going to see women. They're yeah. going to see kids. They're going to see fathers and sons. They're going to see brothers and sisters. And that's okay. But people see in people something different than they do from the landscapes, right? So, so that they are willing to make that leap for the three Confederate prisoners or for the home of the rebel sharpshooter, the dead sharpshooter, yeah. um, you know, uh, is not surprising at all to me. No. You, we want to know who these people yeah. are. There was, uh, when I was preparing for the JFK show, there was a, a lecture I was watching about the Zapruder film. And the guy, and I can't remember his name, but he said the Zapruder film is a Rorschach test because people see what they will see. And it's completely different. You know, it, it tells you more about the viewer than what is viewed. Mm -hmm. And I think this is kind of what you're saying there where people pick out a black soldier and white, yeah. white troops and a woman and, you know, it's and just, brothers, yeah. yeah. And, and or an orb or a light, light rod, a what? <laughs> an orb or a light oh. rod. <laughs> to, yeah. 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 A shadow figure or whatever. So yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. All right. So, um, the, Brady and these guys, they would then d show the photos that they would take of the battle and, and of battles. And I think it's important to point this out. And I'm sure most of our viewers know this, but for the newbies, this was like the first American war that was really heavily photographed and shown to the public. We always hear about, you know, the, the public sentiment against Vietnam um, it turned, you know, it soured because every night on the news we're getting casualty reports, we're getting film from the yeah. front and everything like that. But that's not the first time it really happened in American history. The Civil War is where people are seeing their dead sons um, in these photographs. 
And so go into that a little bit, if you yeah. can. First, let me say, just because you reminded me, you know, one of the earliest attempted identifications of the dead sharpshooter is a mother who lost her son during the Civil War and much later said, oh, my God, that's my son. But mm. he's he's from a Virginia unit, nowhere near that. He fought near Culp's Hill, you know, and it's just it's inconceivable that it could be him. Her son um, is in a Virginia unit. Yeah, her son yeah. was in a Virginia unit. He died at Gettysburg. She right. attributed that again. She said that, oh, my God, that's my son. Right. You know, thinking Gettysburg, OK, you know, that could be him. Um, you know, she might not have had a picture of him. I mean, you know, and I, I've never had that experience, but you could forget what somebody looks like 20, 30, 40 years later. Um, or people can look alike. Yeah. Yes, exactly. You know? A lot of people look yeah. alike, you know, and there's something about that corpse because he's not bloated like most all the others. He looks like a son. He, yes. You know, it's like one you want to son. be your kid. He look, look at how at peace he is. He looks like but, your son sleeping yeah. on the couch on a warm afternoon. Yes. You know? Yeah. yeah. That's pretty sad, actually. It is sad. But, um, so... The Civil War is the first war in world history to be largely photographed. I mean, by far. OK, it is also the first one in which the photos of human carnage were actually seen by the public. You know, there's photos at the North Taku Fort and Indochina and things like that where there were photos taken, but they were never seen by the public. Mm. So the Civil War is not only the most photographed, it's the first one where the human carnage really reached the public. OK, and I already mentioned this only really happened eight times. And the first of which was at Antietam, the most prolific of which by far was Gettysburg with twice as many as anywhere else. And is um, that just because of where Gettysburg is located? Uh, you know, I don't know. It's be, I mean, if the location allowed Gardner to get here quicker and because of the huge volume of dead compared to the other places photographed at, you know, Second Fredericksburg or Corinth, you know, I mean, it's just there's simply more dead bodies around in a more compact area. Um, you know, that could definitely affect it. That also impacted why you have so many different photographers coming here within the year of the battle, right? So... You know, at Antietam, we have these great accounts from newspapers, the most famous of which says, if Mr. Brady has not taken the bodies and dragged them to our door yards, he has done something very like, it. Yeah, you know, yeah. so shocks the nation. It's not the good death that they'd expected. You know, he's, oh my God, my son's not dead on top of a parapet, cold, holding a flag with a little bit of a trickle of blood. Instead, <laughs> you know, our dead sons are face pressed to the earth, lonely, far from home, right. the saddest and least glorious possible thing. You know, so I've always said, and I, I don't have the best, like, I don't have people actually saying this, but my understanding is, is that, you know, people saw these photos and must have said, you know, uh, uh, look how terrible this is. We have to end this terrible war. Sure. And that others, including Abraham Lincoln, says, no, we need, <laughs> no, we need to continue this struggle so that the dead, these dead, these shall honored not. dead shall not have died in vain. So just like today. You know, uh, you know, for whatever conflicts are going on in the world, people l line up on various sides and see the same thing, whether they be flag draped coffins or something else in a different light. And that's beautiful of how we are. How about so you mentioned before where they would they would take the photograph and then they would make copies to sell. Yeah. What was the pr they didn't have Xerox machines? I'm glad you asked. Yeah. You know, so so first of all, the most basic thing that the wet plate process did is that it created a negative, a wet, a glass plate negative that could be printed. Literally, take it up to your roof or somewhere out in the sun, put it on a little stand against some light-sensitive albumin paper. There you go. Okay, keep it in the sun for a minute or six or something like that. It burns onto the paper. Get a new piece of paper, do it again. Get a new piece of paper, do it again. Mm -hmm. You might also take another picture of that negative or of that photo that you just printed and make a second negative or a third to try to speed up productions. And there was a production house in... Um, you know, New York, the E and H T Anthony's who made most of the stereo views of the civil war. Uh, they've made the largest series during, and then after it, um, them and Taylor and Huntington. In any case, that's not the only way though. First of all, they could also sell a copy of that photo to a newspaper that could then make an engraving or a woodcut out of it. So a lot of people were seeing the civil war battlefields in the same way they'd been seeing them for a while, except that the drawings were based on photos. You know, okay. some of them were extraordinarily accurate. So woodcuts or engravings was as close as they could come in the 1860s to printing halftone photographs, photographs that we now know go into magazines and onto our phones, right? So, so that was another option. And then, you know, another option too is to take that photo, blow it up into an engraving or a photo, and then hand color it and sell it for more. Right. Okay. But most of the Civil War photos will be seen in magazines or they'll be sold as either 3D photos, stereo cards, or they'll take a portion of that stereo card and print it as a CDV, carte de visite. Or as I heard someone say on a recent podcast, and sorry, the person's a friend of mine, carte de vite. 
<laughs> Sorry, you know who you are. I, I hope you're mortified at that. This was many years ago and on a different podcast than one you're on now. <laughs> so, so, um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So, uh, the, okay. Now, w would they have been able to take the actual photograph and copy it into a newspaper or magazine, or would it always have to have been some kind of like lithograph? Or, it had to be a lithograph, right. engraving, woodcut. They just the technology for printing half tone photographs didn't exist yet. In right. fact, it would be forty years, and it's no surprise that it's after that process comes out. Boom. Here comes Mr. Lincoln's, not Mr. Lincoln's cameraman. Here comes historian with a camera. Here comes Miller's photographic history of the Civil War. Once they were able to do it, books started coming out that showed sure. these. The Century Magazine, you know, first had just, uh, you know, woodcuts. But then you're going to be able to have other magazines that actually have the photos in them. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the, uh, uh, now. W one more thing before you get started. You know, during the Civil War, Alexander Gardner and George Barnard sold you know, sketchbooks or groups of photos, those included individually printed photos for every page of those books. So they mm. were very expensive back then. And mm. on eBay to this day, don't bid against me, you can buy pages from Gardner's sketchbook or Barnard's sketchbook. Uh, it's wow. Great. And yeah. like, what are they going for? They're really It expensive. depends if there's a dead person in it. If it's Gettysburg, a lot more than if it's not. You can get them for $100. I sold one of mine for $150 recently. It was kind of damaged and it was um, uh, like kind of like a Christian commission scene in Germantown, Virginia, I believe. Okay. Um, but I mean, you get like I paid. No, my friend, my loser friend, Justin paid six hundred dollars <laughs> for my Libby prison. Beautiful, beautiful shot. So you can pay hundreds of dollars, you know, for one. You could pay two thousand dollars for, say, one of the Harvest of Death photos or the Dead Sharpshooter. I've seen those for three and four thousand if yeah. they're in great shape. Did I meet Justin? Yes, you I did. did at yeah. the at just the thirtieth like, anniversary. You know, just really, um, sort of like you know, attractively challenged. Yeah. Uh, you know, shorter <laughs> than I am. You know, just real no no redeeming qualities <laughs> no. at all. I, I, I'm sorry to say, oh, you know, gee, I, my mom pays me to. And be this is your best him. friend. I, I actually like the guy. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> was my, nice my best guy. friends are my loser friends. <laughs> yeah, I understand. So are mine. Um, uh, all right. So now, um, you, there, uh, I, I'm sure a lot of people who might be new to all this. Yes, welcome. Exactly, bienvenidos. Um, they might be wondering, but are afraid to ask, and I'll ask it because I'm not afraid to look like a fool. Why didn't they take pictures of battles? Yeah, no, I, that's a great question. You're and welcome. people did try. So well done. Thank you. Uh, you know, first of all, uh, I'll tell a story about one of the most famous photos of the Civil War. You probably know it. It shows some U.S. colored troops, black troops, you know, kind of next to a dilapidated house aiming their guns. Yeah, like, yeah. And it's always portrayed, uh, you know, USCTs, you know, engaged in a battle or something like that. I mean. Who are we when we start thinking about this? And I, I never thought about it for 20 years till Mike Gorman pointed this out. Um, you know, what, is the photographer standing behind a thick stone wall while he places his camera there and, you know, and, and, and then sets it all up right. and, and everything? I mean, you know, we have to think this way about yeah. what's possible. Um, and, and by the way, Gorman has a photo of those same guys standing around and hanging out in perfect safety with the darkroom wagon, like in between them and the enemy. It's yeah, pretty interesting. Yeah. So, so it's pretty cool. You can see that on some of my photo extravaganzas that have been um, recorded. Um, but the answer is because of the two, four, five, seven, ten second exposure times. You know, it just can't show movement. Uh, if you tried to photograph a battle, even if a photographer set up in some place where they could actually you know, feel in comparative safety and photograph it, it wouldn't show up. So the closest things we have, and we do have a couple of things, we have naval battles. We have a photograph taken on a beach at Morris Island um, that shows the USS Irons Ironsides belching out smoke, shooting at Confederate positions around Charleston Harbor. Uh, we have another Confederate photographer in Fort Sumter taking pictures of Union ironclads, also with battle smoke. You can see a little bit of haze and battle smoke at a second Fredericksburg photo taken by uh, Russell. Andrew Russell, I believe. So, hmm. so that's as close as we have. And it's because of the movement. You know, the ghost people love it when there are ghosts and photographs. That's because somebody moved. Yeah. yeah, <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah exactly. Left the scene halfway through. Yeah. Slow shutter speed, we call that. Yes, indeed. Yeah. So in other words, the shutter is like your uh, eyelids. And the faster you blink, you know, the, the more of a... Uh, like a crisper shot you're going to get, a crisper picture you're going to get. But yeah. if you leave it open, you get the streaks. You get streaks unless unless nothing's moving. Well, unless nothing's you know, moving, right. You got to hold very still. And for those of you just listening at home and not watching um, right now, let the record show that Matt was blinking rapidly yes. as he told the story. 
Yes, and I'm, I'm making, Look, we cursing my con- lips. We have control over our motor functions. <laughs> yes, we we're not that old yet. That not we that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, everybody out there. Um, yeah, photography, though, at this time, also, I mean, you know, uh, yeah, you're documenting the war. You're doing portraits to send home to mom. Um, but also, it, and that's a good historical uh, record that photography leaves. But also, it helps with medical research and things um there's a lot of photos of wounds and instead of now you know a doctor going into a book with a drawing uh of someone's wound Mm -hmm. here they can actually go and find a photograph of that wound and look at it more clearly yeah so i mean it it, it, it's not just a uh i don't want to say fun thing because dead soldiers is not a fun thing but uh it's not just for morbid curiosity yeah, or entertainment purposes. Yeah, I've heard stereo photography be called the, the well, it used to be blockbuster of its day, the Netflix of its day. Because how else are you going to travel the world and see the pyramids of Egypt and the Leaning Tower of Pisa and yeah. everything like that? Yeah. You know, and all of a sudden you can only see them, but see them in 3D, not a drawing. You know, right. like actually, that's them. And, you know, if there are practical applications, uh, you know, to say, okay, this is what gangrene definitely looks like as opposed to something else. This is the medical procedure I did to to show this or even just like, listen, this is how this is what it looks like in Virginia. I mean, yeah. think about it in a society where most people didn't leave their home state or many, if not, many didn't leave their county, let alone their home state, their whole lives. They get to see what South Carolina. Oh, my God, here's a live oak. Yeah. Like, you know, just the practical yeah. applications of photography of actually a photograph is so much different. Right. Uh, you know, than 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 the drawing. I mean, we can all see it. And that it can and bring York, the world to you without you ever having to leave your home. Exactly. Yeah. The Netflix of its day. Yeah. Except <laughs> stereo view and chill isn't really nice of a. It's not as catchy of an invitation. They must have had one then. But, you know, they (laughs) even had, you know, six six at a time viewers, you know, for people out in the field or at attractions where you'd go and pay a nickel and you'd get to look at photos. I'm sure they were all totally legit. You mean the ones that flip? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, one stereo view, another one. And they had these viewers. And we've even got one picture of soldiers using one of those in Atlanta. You know, like a a commercial version of the little hand handheld home base viewer. I um uh, I remember as a kid I, I want to say it was on the boardwalk at the Jersey Shore they had one of those old machines and you put your nickel in or whatever and you put your eye up to the thing. And well, you crank you're talking it. about a movie though. I'm talking about like a, a thing because I did that too. Yeah, up in Wisconsin, like at the tourist towns. Happen, yeah, you know? yeah, 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 yeah. Um, you know, I'm talking about where you pay your money and you could see one photo and then you click a thing and tr- there's another photo. Oh, and, oh, yeah, yeah. You know, kind of yeah. like a ViewMaster in a right, way. And by right. the way, Ian H T Anthony, those companies actually became ViewMaster later. So the the Civil War oh. era stereo view people became ViewMaster, which you and I grew up with. Isn't that interesting? I, I would imagine that the. Uh, uh, the technology that came out of Civil War photography, if if we hadn't had the Civil War, I wonder if photographic technology would have advanced as rapidly as it did in those four years. I wonder how much, because, you know, with medical technology and military technology, all these other technologies, warfare seems to accelerate yeah. their advance. Yeah, I would be hard pressed to come up with how photography advanced substantially because of the war other than that a lot more photographers started taking pictures in more trying circumstances you know field photography and you know how to maybe the dry plate version like you know okay this can be practically done and there are photographic magazines like at the time in philadelphia seems to be a place where they did a lot of this you know and and they are the amateur societies and they're all talking about what works and what doesn't so with more photographers out there and more money to be made by soldier portraits no doubt there's some advancements made just because it's being done so much more. So maybe not uh, photograph technology, but photograph technique improved yeah. in that yeah. time. And more teachers, more students, yeah. you know, more people taking this on as a, as a career. And some of these people remember like, you know, like Brady's nephew ended up with his stuff. And I think he became photographer, Levin Handy, if I'm correct, I could be wrong about that. But some of these, some of this, sometimes this became a family business. Sometimes, huh. you know, they switched careers to join this or leave this situation, you know? Sure. You know, today you look at, um, uh, you know, you see video on TV of some war scene that's going on in the news and uh, you'll see the press the photographers, the war correspondents and everything, and the photographers are getting in there and they're, and they're right there. And the 
participants, the combatants, whoever they are, it's like they're, they're ignoring them. There might as well be a tree, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I guess it's because, well, A, you got to worry more about where the next bullet's coming from, not where the photographs are coming or being taken yeah. from. And B? And B, what? I, I think I have what you're going to say. Go. B, this is part of their lives. They grew up being photographed. They know they're going to be photographed at the time. There's cameras all over the place, and it's just not special. Exactly. The way it was, oh, it's the what's-it wagon. <laughs> right. like, you know, when a photographer came to town, you can see people gathering around just watching because it was this big spectacle, and it, it wasn't in Vietnam. But were they, were they, were photographers considered ghoulish? The, like the ones that would like, was there a stigma to being a photographer at the time? I, I don't know that. Um, okay. You know, it's incredible. We, what we have is the 10,000 photos they took. What we don't have are diaries, and journals, mm. and we have so few things that say how the photographers felt, what they went through. We have documents to be sure. We have, you know, logs from some of the photographers as to what they took. We have their catalogs. We have what they wrote, like Gardner wrote extensive captions about the photos in his, in his sketchbook, you know, but we, we just... Don't know, but but the fact that I have no evidence of somebody saying, "Oh, that's so distasteful that these you know these men went and photographed the poor you know dead men and horses," you know, right afterward, we don't have a lot of that. In fact, if anything, the public couldn't get enough of it. No, yeah. that doesn't mean that the public loved it, and therefore the soldiers had to like it. But right. the soldiers were also going to the photographic tent and everything like that. And you know, did the burial crews, and there's several that burial crews photographed during the Civil War at Antietam, at Gettysburg, at Spotsylvania. You know, did they like stopping their work to pose? At Spotsylvania, they didn't even stop. Like, they're just, they just going about their work while the photographer's working. You know, we can only guess. Mm. Um, all right, so you're running on time. So I've got nine I, minutes. All right, so in that nine minutes, I want you to make one more point that you want to make, and then I want to ask you about greenhouses. All right, good. Here's the one I want to make. Uh, I mentioned that these are glass plates, and I already mentioned that they're coated with a chemical sheet, okay? This differentiates them from the 35 millimeter negatives you and I grew up with yeah. and from the modern digital stuff that we now grow up with because those two things have grain and pixels, respectively, mm -hmm. okay? The, the, the glass plate negatives had none of that. It's a chemical sheet, and theoretically, once scanned at a high enough resolution, you can blow it up to, I'm not going to say the molecular phase, but I'm going to say the molecular stage because there, there is no loss of fidelity, right. okay? What I'm saying is, is that anyone listening that thinks, oh, no, my digital 4x5 better than, and of course, because if you're saying something I don't like, you sound like a caveman. So no, cave me 4x5 <laughs> negative digital, <laughs> bigger, uh, you know, you know, uh, you know. <laughs> I, I would just ask you to stand 15 feet away from somebody and take a photo of them in the best conditions in bright light and see if you can see their fingerprints. And then you'll approach a great Civil War plate. And if you don't believe him, you can go to the Library of Congress and you can get the high res scans. There's one that's taken. I forget the name of the town, but it was some like mining town or some kind of boom town out west post-war. And it was just taken from a bluff on one end of the town and all the way to the other end. You know, small little village type of thing. Yeah. And you could take this thing and zoom in all the way to the far end of the town and you can see details that you would not ever be able to see on a digital yeah. shot. The, and the larger the plate, the better. A, yeah. a, a four by 10 stereo plate, not nearly as good as a seven by nine. And that's not nearly as good as an imperial size plate. So it depends. So use them. Like there's, there's people think, oh, all these photographs you have, Gary, they're not mine. They're ours. They're the right. American people's. Go to the Library of Congress, like Matt said, download the highest resolution picture, especially when there's people in it, you know, and my guess is that 90% of the time you're going to be glad that you did because you're going to yeah. zoom in and find something of interest to you. Yeah. And if you don't know, high resolution, all that stuff. Usually it's best to just find the largest file that you can find. Yeah, or I was going to say, find a young person in your house. <laughs> <laughs> who can tell, who can someone tell under difference. 30. Yeah. All right. So now the thing I want to end with, and, um, you know, of course, you know, I could go on for hours with you. I love talking to you. We, but, okay. Ken Burns. Yeah. End of the Ken Burns uh, series. Uh, David McCullough says, as they zoom in on a plate, of glass in a greenhouse with a, which is a negative of a photograph uh, that uh, by at the end of the war, most of these originals were, you know, used for greenhouse glass and, and yeah. what else? Um, is that true or not? Well, we haven't had our train wreck yet. So could you go to slide number nine? 
the slide ninth slide number nine. Here we go, show. ladies and gentlemen. We're going to go. Oh, uh, see, now I was using the wrong mouse. So oh already God, the train wreck has begun. Uh, I, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> oh. I'm going to ask him to pull up a photo because I referenced it. These are going to be. Would you say be, slide number going, nine? Yeah, number nine. Keep going number after nine. the stereo car. That number one. Number nine. Yeah. Okay. Let oh, me that's just really look. zoomed oh, hold in. That's kind of cool, actually. I'm going to pull out. What you're seeing there are sleeves that have negatives in them. That is Matthew Brady's nephew's study. So what you're looking at oh, okay. are, there you are the what negatives. look like album covers that are being yeah. poorly treated. That's paper, each one holding what I would consider a pr priceless glass plate. Now, okay. Now you got to go back to that 100% because I'm going to ask you to I go to the next. I've lost it now. Oh, I, I know. Go okay. back up to view. There you go. Okay, thank you. And let's not deviate. We're going to stick it at the 100%. Yeah, now move it okay, over a little bit. moving it over. Now, Here we go. Go to that oh, next the, slide there now. The next slide. Okay. So this one. These guys I already mentioned it. They left catalogs. We know what photos Brady and Gardner and E H E and H T Anthony offered. Okay. We have their catalogs and we know where the photos are. They're at the Library of Congress. I'm uh, not the photos, the the glass plate negatives. They're at the Library of Congress, the National Archives, the Smithsonian, and, and whatnot. We, we we can account for ninety five percent of so these photos. So where does this come from? Okay. This myth. So um, go to the next one. So we have this idea of the plates, right? And you can see a guy holding a four by ten inch plate. That's a smaller type of plate, by uh -huh. the way, they get bigger than that. And then go to the next one here, you know, because people have mocked it. So Brady, <laughs> uh, Ken Burns rightly zoomed in on a greenhouse uh -huh. and showed a fading plate or something like that. Uh, when you went to get your photo taken, sometimes you took two or three, or sometimes you ordered prints, but never, but didn't go back to get the negative and stuff. Uh -huh. These are failed these are duplicates, okay. and and the Library of Congress has come up with one or two examples where actual good photos have been lost. But the idea that they've all burned away in the nation's greenhouse is simply false. Go to the next one. I've seen where they keep them. That's the file cabinets at the Library of Congress. Go to the next one. I open the file cabinet, and I see the sleeves with the individual things in it. Go to the uh -huh. next one. Going to I the next one. ask them, and once in a while they will take out. There's the skeletons at Cold Harbor. I see wow. the dead sharpshooter there. That's see, the original? That's it. That's the witness glass. You know, <sighs> that's that that plate was in the camera when the sun bounced off of the dead sharpshooter and went back into the camera onto the plate. Witness glass. It was Amazing. there that day and handled by Gardner and his crew. And you it's see, obviously very exciting for you. Yes, because I take <laughs> selfies with them and then I, I've proved it. So you can close the slideshow now, but that's, you know, I, I've done this and there's something about this, like, you know, touching, you know, the hat or the uniform piece or sure. being there with the witness glass. It's like touching the boulder that is in the picture, but even maybe more so because my God, not everybody's I'm touched so, it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm so glad that these things have been scanned because w should they be lost, at least we have them digitally preserved at a pretty high resolution. Yeah. So, so I would love to bust that myth away. I would love to bust the myth that because they dragged one body, it means they were always dragging bodies. I wish I could bu bust the myth about Matthew Brady taking either all or none of the photos of the Civil War. Um, so there's, there's the photographic myths that come along with it, but I still firmly believe you know, Ken Burns is the best documentary ever made on the whole Civil War, by far. Oh, yeah. And I can undo those messes much easier than I could create the spark in the first place. Yeah. The Gettysburg movie, Ride with the Devil, Glory. Oh, love Ride you know, with the I, Devil. I, I'll take these all day long with any imperfections, you know, because, uh, you know, they help to create the sparks and the interest. Yeah, and and, and th that's not to, to knock the camera. First of all, how long did it take him to do that? Five years to do that film? I think so. Something, Something like, like that, that yeah. right? And these are filmmakers, not historians, yeah. putting this this film together. Yeah. There's going to be mistakes, you know. So it's not a, in any way yeah. a, a knock at Ken Burns. Yeah, let me close with a friend of mine once was working with an artist, and this artist wanted to do a Gettysburg scene. And my friend had an idea of what he wanted to do, and he's like, oh, I'm going to do, it's going to be great, Gary. You're going to be a star, and we're going to put uh, Alexander Gardner in here. By the way, your hair looks really good. And, uh, you know, and it's going to be like this, but can I say that there are troops charging this way? And I was like, no, they didn't charge that way. Right. And I said they charged the exact opposite way. He's like, but it's conceivable that they could have charged this way. And I said, no, no, we know they didn't charge this way, but you don't know for sure that not one of them didn't charge this way. <laughs> you know? and, and that is, you know, the artist, the filmmaker, the documentarian, you know, sometimes you have a vision and you have a story you want to tell. Yeah. And is it right enough? Maybe. But I'll tell you, when, when I first and until actually until I learned that that's not true, uh, every time I see that, I get that little punch in the gut mm -hmm. going, Oh, how yeah. could you do oh, that? God. Like, why wouldn't you save those things? What ha What are we missing because you people did that? But that's not true, thank God. Yes, I'm glad. 
or think whatever you think. Well, you know, I didn't see any real train wrecks today, man. I, I'm no, proud we of didn't. You. We well, we were able to talk without having to rely on visuals, which you know is good. The perfect photo presentation. <laughs> <laughs> hey, let me just say, everybody, you know, that I, I, I do this for a lot of battlefields. It's not just Gettysburg. And if you start searching on YouTube, look for you know photography and Tatum Gettysburg. But the ones I'm most proud of are actually. If you look on the Trust YouTube, I did a photographic piece for uh, finding the photos northwest of Atlanta and another piece that I found at Camp Winfield Scott at Yorktown. Uh, the, the, this is where it shows the work of the photographic historian. And I, I'm proud of the work I did there, but it, it more could help other people learn, hey, how can I solve my own mystery? Because I am, I might be equipped with a certain doggedness, but I don't have any special artic, artistic or virtual reality abilities that allow me to determine which photos were taken where. Right. Uh, you know, so, so I firmly believe that other people can do this as long as they're careful about it. So yeah. there's my, my call to action. Well, there you go. And we'll end with that. Gary, thank you very much for coming in. Always a pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're watching, thank you for watching. If you're listening, thank you for listening. And we will talk to you next time. <laughs> oh, yeah. I forgot to add the music. <laughs> See, I was ready. I do listen to the show. Are you a reenactor or living historian? Or maybe you're a War of Rights player and want to bring esprit de corps to your team. Well, then you need the Badge Maker, the leading provider of Civil War and other historical badges and insignias. Mention this ad with an attached message in your order and receive a free surprise gift. I myself bought a metal Second Corps badge, and it always starts a conversation when I wear it. So hit up the Badge Maker at CivilWarCorpBadges.com. Something for everyone and anyone. Our hearts so stout have got a stain, for soon it is known from whence we came. Wherever we go, they dread the name of Gary Owen in glory. Instead, it's far, we'll drink down there, we'll pay the reckoning on the nail. No man for that shall go to jail from Gary Owen in glory. Instead, it's far, we'll drink down there, we'll pay the reckoning on the nail. No man for that shall go to jail from Gary Owen in glory.